Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today we have with us uh, Arno Shuya from um, uh, CU Boulder. Uh, Arno is, uh, has been at CU for a couple of years now, about three years. And um, previously he was at uh, the Paris Geophysical Institute uh, for about 10 years. And prior to that, he did a postdoc in, uh, in Florida, Florida State. Um, our, today, Arnaud will talk to us about uh, geomagnetism, which is a slightly different topic than what we normally uh, have <laughs> talks about, but interesting nonetheless. Arnaud, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, I realize it's going to be probably different from <laughs> maybe many of the talks that you usually see. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, geomagnetism and, and, and particularly about observational geomagnetism. So really, uh, the side of geomagnetism that deals with observations and not so much about theory. Um, so my, my topic here um, is really, um, you, know, you know, geomagnetism is a very old science. I mean, we have made geomagnetic observations for centuries now. Um, but really over the past, let's say 15 years or 20 years, um, there has been an acceleration in the rhythm of new observations made available to the community, uh, and also in an improvement, a significant improvement in the quality of these observations. Uh, this has been brought by high precision magnetic satellites, a stream, a nearly continuous stream of uh, high precision magnetic satellites that have been launched um, over the past 15 years. So it's, this is the, you know, the, the way I, I, I like to approach this talk. Um, first, I'm going to um, provide you a, a brief update about where we are at regarding uh, geomagnetism observation from space and uh, what, what is the, the current uh, status of that. And then I'm going to focus more on um, two particular topics which I think illustrate quite well uh, the improvements that has been brought by the magnetic satellites over the past decades. Um, one of them will be uh, uh, dealing with the, the core field, so something that's probably even more remote from what you are used to because it's going to be solid earth stuff. And the second one is going to be about the SQ field, so something probably uh, I mean, much more familiar to at least some of you here uh, related to ionosphere. Um, so really, this is an introductory slide that shows um, you know, typical ground-based measurements, geomagnetic ground-based measurements. And you can see here, this is one year of measurements at dumont d'Urville Observatory uh, in the Antarctica and one year of measurements at Addis Ababa uh, in Africa. And you can see that um, these, these two uh, recordings show uh, different phenomena, uh, different time scales, different amplitudes. I mean, their amplitudes are much larger in dumont d'Urville uh, due to uh, this observatory being uh, at high latitudes. And then on Addis Ababa, you recognize the regularity of the overall electrojet. So a lot of spe a lot of temporal scales, and uh, thanks to these ground-based measurements, we we have a fairly a very good um, uh, knowledge uh, of the geomagnetic temporal spectrum, which is represented here, and especially um, if I can sh find. A Especially this part is, uh, is fully covered by ground-based measurements. So, but what we see also is that <clears throat> there are a lot of sources uh, that contribute to this spectrum and that makes the geomagnetic signal very complex. There are sources that um, uh, come from sources that are in interior to the Earth, for example, the Earth's core, the fluid core, uh, core flows generate magnetic fields, and especially they generate the main magnetic fields, which is about 95% of the field. And then you have a lot of other sources, magnetized rocks in the crust, uh, which are static. You have induced fields in the mantle, which are induced by uh, time-varying fields uh, of external origin. And of course, uh, when you leave the solid Earth, you have all the sources in the ionosphere, all the electric currents and, and, and further away in the magnetosphere. What we see on this, on this, uh, on this figure is that um, the geomagnetic sources have very different spatial scales. I mean, there are some uh, tiny ones uh, regard, I mean, compared to the size of the Earth, of course. Like, for example, here, the, the sources in the equatorial region. And there are some enormous ones, like the fluid core, for example, or the magnetospheric currents that fly several Earth radii from the Earth. So the scales of the geomagnetic signal that will be um, measured at the Earth's surface uh, will, will be very uh, highly variable. Uh, 
And we, we understand, of course, from this that um, uh, number, even a, a large number of spot measurements at the Earth's surface are not enough to, to really capture the complexity of this, uh, of this uh, set of sources, and uh, especially uh, the time variations of them. So th this shows a little bit more in detail um, how the magnetic field strength varies uh, with respect to spatial wavelength. And uh, you can see here that um, this, this white line shows uh, the maximum, um, maximum spherical harmonic degree, which can be um, um, described by the Global Observatory Network that's currently uh, recording measurements. Um, we are missing a lot with only ground-based measurements. For example, we are missing all the um, uh, field line currents and high latitude currents. Of course, we don't miss them entirely because uh, we can see them in some observatories. But what, what is meant to say here is that we, we miss the structure, the spatial structures of these currents by just relying on, on this global system. And we need, that's why additional um, sets of magnetometers have been installed in some locations to actually capture the variations of these currents. For the lithospheric fields, it, the situation is even uh, worse because uh, most of the lithospheric field, as you see, is behind uh, these white lines here and still cannot be captured by even, uh, even the current uh, global observatory network. So the solution to this is obviously to have uh, satellites. And now it's been some time that we have uh, good satellites. But for a long time, it's, it was very uh, there were a lot of gaps, I mean, temporal gaps. So the first uh, magnetic satellites were the OGO-2, 4, and 6, which were launched by NASA in the 1960s. Um, these were satellites flying um, on elliptical orbits between 400 and 1,500 kilometers, I mean, between. I mean, some of them between 400 and 1,000, some of them between 400 and 1,500. And uh, they were carrying a scalar magnetometer that you can see here. I'm losing my... Now, see. Yeah, so the scalar magnetometer was at the top of this boom in order to to record uh, a clean signal. I mean, not, that is not um, uh, compromised. I mean, um, I mean, not recording the disturbances that come from the, the spacecraft itself. Uh, then, a um, little bit later, uh, a second satellite wa was launched by the US, the MAXSAT satellite. And MAXSAT was uh, the great improvement regarding to POGO is that it was carrying a vector magnetometer. So the vector magnetometer was able to record the three components of the magnetic field. And that's extremely important, uh, especially for main field studies and crustal field studies. Because if you don't have the vector field measurement, um, there is a, a fundamental um, an ambiguity um, when you try to model the field. I mean, basically, the null space of the inversion is quite large. And uh, you can have a lot of uh, magnetic fields that actually uh, fit the observation, and uh, a lot of different uh, magnetic fields that, at the global scale, that fit the observation. So you have a lot of you have a lot of uncertainty about some aspects of the magnetic field. So having vector magnetic fields uh, measurements provided uh, really the first accurate map of the core field at the global scale. Um, then, 20 years later, the Ørsted satellite was launched by uh, Denmark. And Ørsted is still flying, so it's really a, a big success story, um, although it's not uh, transmitting data anymore. But um, it's been providing uh, tremendously um, high quality data for, for more than 10 years and even almost 15 years. So you can see here that. As with any magnetic field satellite, there is a long boom, as long as possible, to be far away from the spacecraft. And here, there was this uh, scalar magnetometer and a vector magnetometer here. So usually, these satellites carry two magnetometers. Uh, the reason is because, uh, um, I mean, the flux gate magnetos magnetometers that are usually um, installed for uh, recording the vector, vector field, um, drift in time. So that's the fundamental problem. They, they drift in time. Um, they don't drift much. I mean, so if you're in large signals, that's not a big issue. But when you're interested in a few nanotesla, uh, which is what typically we need for uh, core field studies and crustal field studies, it's very important to have uh, an accurate reference 
an absolute reference that you can use to periodically recalibrate your vector field magnetometer. And this is what the absolute, um, the scalar magnetometer is, is, is doing here. So that's why usually there is a scalar magnetometer, so that um, the d direct measurements of the modulus of the field can be used to periodically recalibrate this instrument. The CHAMP mission, uh, uh, just one year later, and um, it was flying a little bit lower, so the, the, the instrument uh, payload regarding the magnetometry uh, was uh, quite similar to the Erstedt one, but it was flying a little bit lower, and as a result, CHAMP was very successful for um, providing uh, maps of the crustal field. So that was, uh, that was one of the big success of CHAMP. Another big success was that as it was flying lower, it was flying within the upper layers of the ionosphere, and it was also closer to currents. And uh, uh, this is not something, uh, I mean, something that uh, many of you uh, here know very well. So CHAMP provided also a lot of original results for the ionospheric currents. So now we have SWARM. SWARM is the, the latest uh, mission. It's an uh, agency mission. And the, well, the general um, um, design is quite similar to CHAMP, actually. So there is uh, the scalar magnetometer here and the vector magnetometer here. Uh, the scalar magnetometer is different. This is a absolute, uh, this is an helium optically pumped magnetometer. There are actually two of them for redundancy. Um, and which has better performance than the, the previous overhauser that was mounted on, on CHAMP. And then you have the here the vector field magnetometer, which is almost the same as on CHAMP, uh, which is um, installed on an optical bench relating it to some star imagers. So there are three uh, star imagers here uh, providing very accurate determination of the attitude. And knowing the attitudes is, of course, crucial if you want to uh, get a good vector field measurement. Because if you measure vector field but you don't know the attitude, then it's just, that's not, that doesn't provide a really useful information. Um, so, so that's why that's why there are, there are, there are these star measures here. Also, the, the, the optical bench makes it sure that um, it's ultra rigid, so that um, there is no torsion or, or movement between these two instruments, and, and really the attitude determination uh, can be uh, uh, transferred to the uh, to where the magnetometer is. There are also other instruments on Swarm, but. Um, especially an electric field instruments here and an accelerometer, uh, but I'm mostly focusing here on the magnetometry package. Uh, swarm performances, uh, require, performance requirements were quite ambitious. I mean, the, 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 really the, the target was to, uh, to have uh, an error, random error for the magnitude of the magnetic field of 0 0.3 nanotesla, which is really small. And, and then also for the magnetic field vector components, a random error better than one nanotesla. And a stability better than one nanotesla per year. Uh, I think we are there for the uh, scalar measurements uh, because mostly it depends on the scalar instrument itself. Um, but uh, for the vector field measurements, uh, there, are, there have been some, some problems along the way, especially some, uh, um, some, some currents that were unexpected and is probably uh, circulating underneath the vector field magnet. So that's adding a tiny tiny signal to the vector field magnetometer that can be detected when comparing it to the scalar magnetometer. Um, so um, I think after the correction, now we are getting close, closer to one and the Tesla, but we're still not there. The swarm orbits. So that's really the originality of this mission. Uh, you know, after CHAMP was to provide a constellation. So not only one satellite, but three of them and uh, three satellites that are identical. Um, so two satellites are flying uh, side by side at lower altitudes. So this is the blue curve here. Uh, and the altitude is slowly decreasing. It's satellite A and C. And then the, the B satellite is flying at an upper altitude here um, and slowly drifting in local time with respect to the lower pair. So the local time separation increases in time. And uh, the target is to have like six hour separation, so the ideal separation uh, somewhere in 2018. So that's really new because um, 
going from one satellite to three satellites, there, there's been a lot of discussion uh, when uh, at the beginning of the SWARM project, how many satellites do we want? Um, at the beginning, I think the original figure was seven, and then it got reduced to four and then to three. Um, of course, you understand the reason why. Uh, but um, the, the finally, they, they settled on three because really the, the lower pair uh, enables, we hope, uh, gradient studies. I mean, studies that rely on the gradient measurement of the magnetic field. Actually, it's more than we hope. I mean, that I said we hope thinking of the crustal field because we are not there yet. But for the other sources, there have, has been already some a number of studies very successfully using uh, separating the sources. And then the upper satellite on local time was to precisely measure, especially. Uh, at two different, two different processes. So I'm done with the, with this brief review on uh, you know where we are at with uh, geomagnetic field satellites, magnetic field satellites, and now I'm going to turn to the <coughs> what can we do with this data. Um, so my first topic is geomagnetic secular variation. So I realize this is really um, mostly the, the most remote from what you are, you are used to here to 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 work on and. To, um, so I'm going to start with something just a primer. So the geomagnetic secular variation is the variation of the core field. Uh, so the, the, the fluid core generates the main magnetic field through the geodynamo process. Um, and because this is a dynamic place, because there are flows, um, this is slowly changing in time. So the main field slowly changes in time, and this is what is called the secular variation. Um, this curve is, shows the secular variation um, in France. Uh, it's been a, you know, a compilation of measurements from the Chambon la Forêt Observatory, which is an observatory there, and then some historical measurements made by a lot of scientists and varying observers along the centuries, and all reduced to the same point. Um, and you see that it varies a lot. I mean, this is the declination. So um, we are now zero, actually, in 2014. We passed zero. But uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was minus 22 or minus 23. So it's really uh, something that changes a lot, and yeah. even on human time scales. So the best known feature is the westward drift. So the westward drift called field model um, that shows uh, the, the, how the declination varies at the Earth's surface over the past 400 years. And you can see that there is um, an apparent movement of the zero declination line toward west. And this is something that's been noticed very by, uh, actually in the 18th century and um, was, was named the westward drift for, because of this uh, westward drifting uh, path. Um, the significance of this now probably decreased because we, we understand that at the, what's happening is the core is much more complicated than simple, simply the westward. There are many more um, processes going on there. But this is um, you know, the resultant of this process, that how it is seen as the Earth's surface, mostly going westward nowadays. So there is also an important um, well-known feature of dipole decay. So <coughs> the core field dipole is slowly decaying. It's been there decaying for more than uh, almost 200 years now. Uh, at more or less regular rate. We don't really know what happens before because uh, we don't have intensity measurements before that date, so we cannot really calibrate the measurements that were done because before 1840, uh, 1830 actually. And so th that's this very active topic in archaeomagnetism, going further back in time in paleomagnetism to, to try to reconstruct the, the, the true intensity of the field and, and see if there has been some episodes like this of dipole decay for several centuries in the past and you know if the rate is similar to the current rate and so on. All of this is related, of course, to the question of whether there will be a reversal soon or not, whether we are on the path to a reversal or not. But really, the thing, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm, I'm going to talk about um, another um, secular variation feature, which, which has the uh, kind of uh, um, not very well chosen name of jerk. Um, it's been discovered more than 30 years ago by simply looking at observatory time series. And people noticed that, well, when you look at observatory time series, for example, this is the, the Y component at Niemek in Germany. When you look at the 
the variation rate of y over like one century, there are phases when it, you know, there is almost um, a linear trend. And then suddenly the linear trend changes. And it's, at that time, the people noticed that it was very abrupt. Um, and they called these events, they called them jerk. Um, I think this refers to some, um, um, the, the use of the, sim, of the same word in, in mechanics for some, uh, for some uh, uh, sudden change in the mechanics. So um, as you can see, there are a number of jerks, actually. So there, are, there is one more here, one more here, one more here. Also, what's, what's noticeable here is when you're plotting the other components especially, is that there is a lot of dispersion in, in this data due to contamination by external fields, um, due to uh, measurement errors. I mean, the observatories are not perfect, far from that, and they make measurements error, and especially when you take the first derivative, this error kind of gets um, enhanced. So um, really, the significance of this abrupt change has been puzzling and uh, really not resolved until now. And nobody really knows, uh, I think, understood um, why there is such abrupt changes. So a few years ago, so we, with some colleague, uh, we, we, we looked at this series, and we, we looked at them over the past decade. And we first, first of all, we noticed that there has been a jerk in 2007. Um, quite pronounced one, especially in the Atlantic sector. And th this shows, uh, this is an observatory in Senegal, Embu, and you can see a very sharp change of slope um, and here, and this is the Z component. Very sharp change of slope. So what we did is that we also looked at you know, existing models of the Earth's magnetic field derived from satellite data at the same period. And um, we plotted especially, we, we looked at the secular acceleration. So the acceleration would be the first derivative of the variation itself. So we expected to see a larger acceleration here and a larger acceleration of opposite sign here uh, on, the, on both sides of the jerk. Um, and what we saw actually was quite surprising because not only did we see a larger acceleration here and larger acceleration there, but we also saw at the global scale, so when integrating over the whole sphere, uh, what, at that, what we call the pulse, I mean, the, the whole energy of the secular acceleration was kind of peaking just before the jerk in 2006. Uh, so this corresponds to this uh, increased slope here. So this means that at the global level, and when this, there is there is more energy in the acceleration before the jerk. Um, so at the, at the beginning we were quite skeptical of this because all these models that, including the one that we used at that time, were were are heavily regularized in time. So we we never know if this is an effect of the regularization in time that you know can um, enhance. Um, uh, some uh, so the power of the secular acceleration, especially the second derivative for some years and minimize it for some other years. Um, but before coming to that, I'd just like to um, go into bit, to a bit more details about how we do core field models. So core field models are really simple spherical harmonic expansion of the potential of the magnetic field. Uh, so it's, I mean, the technique has been here forever. Um, and usually, uh, the time var dependence is described by typically B spline. Um, and the regularization is applied to minimize the complexity of the model. But what's really tricky is that uh, when, when, you, when you downward continue, I mean, the, the, the thing that we do usually to understand what's going on at the core is to take a model calculated at the Earth's surface and then downward continue it down to the core. Uh, using the property of uh, the dependence, the radial dependence here. Um, but you can see that there is an amplification factor which uh, increases with the degree. So the more, the higher the degree, the more amplified it's going to be down to the core. But it also means that the error will, be, uh, will become larger for, for larger degrees. This shows, uh, this is a nice word by Chris Finlay. Um, from the GOFM model, the historical field model, that shows this uh, this effect. I mean, so this is the field. I think this is the Z component uh, at your surface, and then when going down to the core, you you see the um, 
smaller scale features that are appearing. So, so this is the main field. So what we are looking at here is the secular acceleration, which is the second derivative in time of this. And of course, uh, we can be suspicious of you know, uh, how the, the small features are uh, enhanced by this. So after that, um, I did a second um, study with, with uh, Stefan Maus, and we decided to look at this in, in more uh, specifically and to build robust uh, secular acceleration models. Um, and we changed the philosophy. I mean, instead of using one model and then regularizing in time, we, we build a series of, um, of models over smaller intervals. And so we, we selected three-year intervals. And then we, we use a sliding window with a step of 30 days. So we got a collection of models. And for each model, we calculate both the main field secularization and the secular acceleration. So all the first two um, temporal um, derivatives. And what we found here that first of all, we, when plotting the, the power spectrum with respect to the, for each degree and with respect to the time, we got confirmation that there is actually a pulse in 2006. I mean, this, this shows very nicely on this collection of models. And here, each and every model is independent from the other. So there is no risk of having uh, regularization effects. And uh, not only did we find this pulse in 2006, but we found another one uh, later in, in 2009. So, so, so that was interesting. And then we plotted the, the obtained secular acceleration at the core surface. And the um, uh, second surprise was to see that actually the, the secular acceleration in 2006, so during the pulse when the energy is maximum, um, was made of these uh, three main patches, and a fourth one here, maybe. Um, but in 2009, so the second pulse, uh, three years later, was actually the same patches, but um, with uh, opposite polarity. So as if there is a kind of uh, oscillatory, feature, oscillatory phenomenon here in the core that's uh, producing some enhanced acceleration in 2006 and enhanced acceleration in 2009. So we, we, we looked for what kind of phenomenon can create such uh, an observation, because really this is an observational result. <clears throat> so we, we, we went back to the theory waves in the, in the Earth's core. And, the, uh, it's, and we found that the actual number of, they're not so common because when you consider the, so this is the magnetic field strength within the core. And the yellow is what's considered acceptable uh, currently by geodynamo theory. Uh, so outside the yellow, it's something that doesn't, probably doesn't happen in the core. And then you have the blue one, which is what's actually been observable, especially by satellites, the lower part of the blue one. So we need to find some, some waves in this, in this small rectangular area here. So there are two candidates, or maybe three. The first one is torsional oscillations. So torsional oscillations are a wave that uh, happen in the core. And as their name indicates, I mean, they are um, oscillations of cylinders uh, around that are uh, vertical, I mean, uh, actually symmetric, and that are oscillating with respect to each other with the inner core in the middle. So this is the first, uh, this the first candidate. However, we did some um, inversion to try to, to see if the observed secular acceleration could be actually caused by uh, flows of typical, that are typical of torsional oscillations. We couldn't find any, um, any, any good uh, fits to that. So we, we ruled out this torsional oscillation uh, hypothesis. The second uh, possibility is that we have slow magneto uh, Coriolis waves. So we didn't really investigate this in detail, uh, but the problem is that it would require quite a strong magnetic field in the core, which currently is not the, um, the favorite uh, scenario for what's happening in the Earth's core. A third uh, interesting possibility uh, we found in the literature was that there could be magnetic Rossby waves. Uh, but for, for, for that to happen, we would need a stratified layer at the top of the core. And uh, it's actually interesting because in the past uh, five years or so, um, a number of studies from seismology, but also from thermodynamics, have pointed to the possible existence of uh, 
stratified layer at the top of the core. It means a layer that's decoupled from the convection that's below it within the core. And if you have a stratified layer at the top of the core, then magnetic Grosby waves are possible and could possibly explain the kind of features that we see. So we did further analysis, uh, extending the, the, the time interval and looking not only into uh, jump data, but also in, in some more recent data. Um, we have a gap with SWARM because uh, CHAMP ended in 2010 and CHAMP and SWARM was launched in 2013. So we used in the middle, uh, in the interval, we used DMSP data, um, Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, um, that were uh, uh, specially um, uh, processed for, 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 for doing core field models by, by Patrick Alken, uh, who could do that. Um, a few years ago. And um, so DMSP data are not as um, good as CHAMP and SWARM data because, first of all, they, they don't have the same, uh, they, they have a larger positioning error. They don't have a scalar field magnetometer that can calibrate the flux yet and so on. So the, the error is larger. But still, we, we wanted to see if there is something to be made out of this data. And um, so these are. Um, so we, we specifically looked into the, the wave uh, hypothesis. How, how we see, and what can we see observ observationally that could reinforce this hypothesis? Um, <clears throat> so what we did is that we, we separated um, uh, the secular acceleration into an equatorially symmetric part and the equatorially anti-symmetric part. So it's something that people do um, um, for in atmospheric sciences for studying some waves in the atmosphere. And so we, we, we wanted to, to, to try that because most of the features that we were seeing in this SA map, secular acceleration map, were actually located near the equator. So we thought maybe there is here some, uh, some symmetrical um, features and some that are not symmetrical. So this is the symmetric part. Um, so we did using, first we used this, this collection of CHAMP models, the same one, and a similar collection of models based on DMSP data. And we plotted time versus longitude diagram at the equator. So we... Uh, the secular acceleration. Yeah, the acceleration, the second order derivative. And so we, we find again this uh, features in 2006, and then in 2009 again, and the anti-correlation between the, the blue one and the red one, which we're, we were seeing on the maps. Um, unfortunately, the DMSP, um, uh, well, we, we see some things, but um, really, I don't think this is very, very um, conclusive here. That really, the error is, is too large to really draw conclusions out of that. So that's actually a nice example of how we need the best data possible for this kind of studies uh, from satellites. I mean, we cannot really use um, uh, data that are not at the same level of accuracy as CHAMP and SWARM for this kind of studies. And then this is another, this is a model, Chaos 5. So this one is, uh, has some regularization in time and also uh, B-spline parameterization. But we see that it, they change a little bit their regularization in this model, and we see that it agrees now very well with the CHAMP models that we have here. And interestingly, um, we see some other features here. So we actually detected a third pulse in 2012, around 2012. And this one is also anti-correlated here. And this is a symmetrical part. So we, we still find this anti-correlation, um, and so the correlation with the first part of the series. So we plotted the period versus uh, wave number um, diagram uh, in order to, to see at, uh, how could this be created by propagating waves. Um, this is, I, I think we, we see here um, some of, a lot of <laughs> different waves. Uh, that are cancelling each other. I mean, minus six and plus six creating a stationary wave, and this is exactly what we see here. But perhaps more interestingly, when, when we plotted the quadrally anti-symmetric components, um, we see some, some patterns here that are uh, really uh, reminiscent of a propagation of a wave. And um, when plotting this period versus wave number diagram, we see a clear signal here uh, at uh, wave number minus two. So this corresponds to waves that are propagating um, uh, at, at the speed of 1,600 kilometer per year. That's very fast, and that's, we were quite surprised to find this. But this is in the data. I mean, this is, this is what we see in the data. And um, 
So the question here now, can we uh, interpret this in terms of uh, waves in the core that are supported by the theory of what's happening in the core? This is work in progress. I mean, the, the theory of equatorial magnetic Crosby waves is, um, has been made, I think, in the 80s in a few papers. And then pe people kind of stopped looking at it because they said, it's too small. We cannot see it. So, so now that we, we see some signals that have some characteristics of these equatorial magnetic Crosby waves, uh, we think it's a good time to actually revisit these studies and, and really uh, see if uh, what we see here are magnetic Crosby waves or something else. We cannot, uh, of course, um, conclude from this that these are magnetic Crosby waves. But we think there is an interesting uh, um, but possibility hypothesis here. OK, so I'm, now I'm going to change topic uh, and move on to um, uh, geomagnetic SQ variation, so uh, leaving the core and going in the ionosphere. Um, so very different uh, sources, of course, the core and the ionosphere. But uh, the, the methods um, that we, we are using are actually quite close. I mean, this is geomagnetism, and we use spherical harmonic expansions. Um, we data processing in order to separate the various sources and so on. So that's why we, I mean, uh, we we work on these different sources. Uh, so SQ variations are generated by, um, um, electri I mean, electrical currents that are uh, typically flowing at mid latitudes in the ionosphere, uh, around 100 kilometers altitude. Um, so I won't say much on that. I mean. I mean a lot of people here uh, are uh, specialists of that. And this is how they look like on the ground at Boulder Observatory, for example. This is a typical diurnal variation of the Earth's magnetic field, which is generated by the rotation of the Earth, the passage of this current system uh, above our heads. It's, um, um, focused on understanding the behavior of this um, current system um, as a function of latitude and also local time, typically. I mean, um, so spherical harmonic analysis of the SQ have been done for a long time, for a very long time. And uh, this is, for example, a very well cited study of Matsushita and Maeda in '65, uh, which shows the, the current system for different months uh, and also showing how uh, it is centered around 45, uh, between 30 and 45 uh, degree of latitude and how it changes with local time. A bit closer to us, um, the comprehensive model, um, which was a big effort by NASA in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, provided a new kind of model for, for the SQ field. So the comprehensive model is, uh, as its name indicates, it's a comprehensive model of all sources of the Earth's magnetic field. It's a climatological data-based model um, it, it, it performs a giant inversion uh, of the, from, from a lot of data, satellite data, observatory data, um, survey data, going back in time over 40 years, and uh, trying to separate, uh, by the pure magic of inversion, uh, the various sources, so the core, the crust, the ionospheric currents like the SQ field, the magnetospheric field, and so on, and even um, the oceanic tides. So in the most recent version. So, um, and this was quite successful. I mean, the comprehensive model uh, was able to actually extract the SQ signal from this mass of data uh, and create uh, this nice model. Uh, for example, here, the Tucson Observatory, you compare the recordings at the observatory with the, uh, with the sum of the SQ field and the other fields especially the magnetospheric field, which leads to these variations here. And you can see that the, the fit is, uh, is not bad at all. The comparison model is very useful, uh, has been very, very much used, because it also provides not only a good description of the total field on the ground, but also a good description of the total field at satellite altitude. And that's very useful when you process satellite data uh, you know, to have a model that gives you a, a good indication of what, you, what to expect. Uh, everywhere and at any time, except during storms. So um, what we did here is uh, is a new kind of model. Uh, on the 
it was what was developed for the comprehensive model. But the philosophy is, is different because we, we, instead of doing a giant comprehensive inversion, we focused on inverting only for the cross, for the SQ field. So we, uh, it's not the inversion that will separate the sources. We separate the sources beforehand, and then we do the inversion. So that's why the name of this model is dedicated ionospheric field inversion, DFE. Uh, it's a SWARM level two product, so it's been kind of uh, uh, approved. I mean, uh, included by ESA into its its, its basket of uh, L2 and L1 products. And the principle is as follows: so we we um, expand the SQ field observations um, in spherical harmonics, and also using a Fourier series to describe the diurnal variation and the seasonal variation. So this is really a climatological model, and we have an f10.7 here uh, variability to reflect the fact that. Um, to take into account the fact that um, uh, solar maximum and solar minimum don't lead to the same uh, currents in the ionosphere because the ionosphere get more ionized and there, then there is stronger SQ currents. So this is a linear parameterization. It's probably uh, an oversimplification of the reality, uh, but this is what we, we use to begin with. Um, so this this model um, so this is the parameterization and this is the parameterization below the sources so typically at the ground and there is a, a similar parameterization above the sources so at satellite altitude so like the comprehensive model it's able to provide the the, the fields both under the, the sources and above the sources um, I think a, a new feature compared to comprehensive model here is that we we use a more sophisticated model for the induction. So instead of relying on a 1D mantle conductivity model, we use a 1D con mantle conductivity model and a conductance shell. So the conductance shell uh, adds the 2D part uh, to the induction, which is very important for SQ because, um, especially above oceans, um, I mean, the, because of the ocean conductance, uh, we will have a much stronger induced magnetic field there. And Typically, the, the induced field uh, contributes to about 30 to 50 percent of the total uh, field that's recorded at satellite altitude. So it's really crucial to have a good description of the induced magnetic field. Otherwise, um, the, the model is, uh, is only partial. I mean, it's incomplete. We also found out that we need to uh, rely on both swarm and ground data to have an accurate description of this, of this uh, SQ field at the global level. Um, the reason is that, uh, well, there are many reasons, but one of them is that the swarm satellites are not fully separated yet. And so, so we, we only have, a, at the time of this model, between one and three hours separation, with one and two, actually. Uh, so there is a large um, uh, er, uh, range of local times that are not uh, covered by swarm at any given time. Uh, so it's necessary to to fill these gaps with the observatory network. So that's why we use observatory data. We, we anticipate that the situation will improve when the satellite will be uh, at 90 degree separation, uh, six hour separation. But um, until we really have a truly uh, much uh, denser constellation, this problem will always persist. Um, we did some extensive validation for this model comparing with independent ground data. So for example, these two observatories here uh, we, we, we look at the uh, mean residuals, and, uh, and we can see that it's, they are comparable for these two observatories that were not used in the inversion and for the observatories that were used in the inversion. So this is a bit technical, but just want to show this slide to show that we actually um, uh, spent some efforts really um, validating this model. And this is an example of uh, the model results on the um, So this is the observatory of Chambon la forêt in France. And, and you can see that um, you can compare the, the, the red dots, which is the model, and the, the black dots, which is the, the actual observation. So the, the, the fit is, is actually quite good. So these are the active periods, uh, periods when we don't use data, and, and the model is not expected to work well during these periods because it is a quiet time model. It's something I should have said at the beginning. It's really a quiet time model, climatological. We don't look at uh, active times. And the same thing for Juan Cayo, uh, well-known observatory in Peru, of, of course, uh, along the equatorial electrojet. And we also recovered the equatorial electrojet, which is much more intense than the SQ at mid latitudes. So this is a movie showing the equivalent current system. 
for, for spring, uh, April 1st, and for different universal time. And what we see here is that obviously there is this uh, uh, displacement of the current system uh, westward, and also the strong effect of the of the magnetic equator here, which deforms, which leads to a, a very different pattern uh, in the American sector. So looking, looking at, into a bit more detail here, for the winter season, we have um, DFI, um, which we find some well-known features of the SQ field. Uh, for example, the, um, the field will be uh, the SQ field is more intense in the southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere in the winter. So this is something, uh, of course, well known because there is um, the ionization is is larger there during the winter. And um, but interestingly, for example, here at some local time and corresponding to uh, some universal time, sorry, corresponding to um, the SQ field uh, current system going over uh, the American sector, we find that uh, the difference become much much smaller. So there is a reduction here of the uh, of the difference, and even we, so they are almost the same uh, amplitudes. So the effect of this uh, uh, magnetic deep equator is strong on the current system. This is for spring. Uh, here we see, as expected, that uh, the intensity is uh, roughly the same in both hemispheres. But also again, that the equator has a strong effect on the shape of the current system. This for summer, uh, also a feature that uh, has been uh, seen before. I mean, it's not new, but that the fact that there is a strong lead of the uh, northern hemisphere current system compared to the uh, southern hemisphere current system here, and that we see, um, so the, it comes first in in local time. It, com it comes earlier in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere, and this is true for uh, for all universal time. And finally, for fall, we see that uh, we have, um, um, well, for some universal time, we have a good, um, um, I mean, we have a good symmetry between northern and southern hemisphere. But some others, there is really uh, some some uh, asymmetry here, and, and some uh, current system becomes more stronger in the southern hemisphere. So um, this is a, a, a graph showing the the evolution with UT. So UT is, is really here, like can be seen as the longitude of the SQ current system, um, of the of the intensity of the northern focus and the, the southern focus, and um, we see that uh, a more complicated picture emerges here, and um, um, especially uh, here when looking in the southern hemisphere. So in the southern hemisphere, we we find this uh, this kind of uh, one, two, three, and and four peak uh, structure here. Um, for for several seasons, and especially uh, for the northern summer, but also to some extent for the northern spring. Um, so it, it it reminds us of this wave force structure that's that's seen in the equatorial ionosphere and has been seen in many different signals, including the equatorial electrojet. Um, so um, we know it's been also seen in the interatmospheric field align currents by some studies based on magnetic data. Uh, so one question here is that uh, is um, why do we have this also in the SQ current system? Um, is this because of um, the connection between SQ currents and interatmospheric field line currents? Um, is it because of some correct connection with the equatorial electrojet? But then why does it only happen in the southern hemisphere and not so not in the northern hemisphere, or at least not in a detectable way in the northern hemisphere? Um, so I think this uh, this, this model um, uh, raises questions regarding this effect. Um, and then this is another um, figure showing again universal time or longitude versus local time difference between the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, um, and we can see that um, um, as pointed before, I mean for the northern summer we see a, a strong lead of the of the summer. Uh, my, uh, current system uh, here. I, I will not spend too much time on that. So, um, conclusion on that is that um, we have a new model for the SQ current system, and we we find some previously known features, um, especially the seasonal asymmetry 
with, with respect to sources is yeah, something I, I haven't talked about um, and that uh, something that was observed from ground data that um, some, some current system in the SQ is, can be asymmetrical with respect to solstices. And uh, this is not new, but we, we also see this in this model that uh, some, some current system is stronger uh, in, the, in the fall than in the spring, or vice versa, depending on the hemisphere. We, uh, the local time lead of the summer current system, the effect of the main field on current morphology and intensity. Uh, so this is very clear, I mean, uh, near the equator, especially in the American sector. And uh, um, something that I haven't showed here, but that's been um, also noticed before, especially in the comprehensive model, and we find again in, in this model, is the small local time lead of the induced current system compared to the primary current system. And um, to my knowledge, the, um, this is not something that's been explained so far. I mean, uh, I haven't seen any explanation, I mean, theory for that. Why is the induced current system uh, leading over the primary current system? New features, um, yeah, something I didn't point out when, when showing the figures is that pupils are found um, in sp larger in spring than in winter. And the wave force structure that I pointed out for the longitude variation of SQ current system. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop here. Um, I have a few uh, references for the DFI. The, the model is also available um, on our website and, um, uh, and also uh, on the SWARM uh, data website where you can access it. Thank you. Sure, Art. Okay. Uh, first, I, I'm not sure if I understood what you were saying toward the end that the induced field was leaving the ionosphere, but I thought that in the model the induced field was determined by the external field by using uh, Kupchenov's right. activity. So it is. It is to some extent. But when we plot the map, I didn't show the maps. This is in my supplementary slides. Uh, there is one here. So the induced field, uh, when, you, when you compare um, the, for example, here, the, the induced field for, for various times and season uh, with the primary field at the same time and the same season, uh, it's slightly leading, so it's slightly more to the west than the primary field, and something that's been um, also seen in the comprehensive model. And uh, so we don't know where it comes from. I mean, it's, uh, but that's. I wonder to what extent that's uh, uh, imposed on, on your model and to what extent it's, and that it's, it's not derived entirely from the data. That's that well, since your induced field is coupled. Well, the, the, the model imposes the way the induced field responds to the external field by, by this Q matrix. So this is complex. There are some uh, geometrical effects because the oceans is not the same geometry everywhere. So it could be an effect of the geometry of the oceans, which kind of uh, make the induced field stronger a little bit westward. But then why would we see this on CM? Because they don't have the conductance shell in there. Um, in their geometries, they only have a 1D mantle conductivity model. So this leads me to think that it's probably not the only reason. I mean, there, there must be some, something else to that. OK. The um, the model. Yeah. Um, it does not explicitly account for any interhemispheric uh, field aligned current, but that's something that your data could I guess by ignoring the interhemispheric currents, I think the way you're fitting the model, they should not really have any tendency to couple and that, that produce biases in your model. They might do some. But anyway, have, have you tried to produce the interhemispheric current that should be right away? Oh, when, when plotting the data before doing the inversion, which we of course do, and we look we have a very close look at this data to make sure that you know they are clean and stuff and so on. We see we see the interhemispheric field and currents like <laughs> very strong. I mean they come very strong and they are very prominent. They are actually sometimes larger than SQ. Um, we hope that uh, I mean they are not supposed to be described by they are not supposed to be potential fields. So we hope that you know <laughs> the potential field method uh, discards them, but we cannot be entirely sure of that. 
um, so the, good, the proper way to do that would be to find a parameterization for the interhemispheric field line currents and, and, and to invert for these currents. Just one altitude that just corresponds to um, toroidal currents, and then, uh, well, not toroidal, since it's almost symmetric, but um, as opposed to toroidal, which would be easy to model. Uh, it's probably possible, yeah. Uh, like the comprehensive model, they, they included some toroidal magnetic fields uh, in their parameterization. Um, this is this is some 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 way we could use to do that. In a plot of magnetic Rossby waves, uh, period versus uh, field strength. Way back. And yeah, you you highlighted a yellow region. I'm not sure what the yellow region was. Yeah, what's the what's the significance? Um, that was um, th this is the area for the magnetic field strength that are well. Uh, reasonable with res I mean compared to the current geodynamo theory. And, and the vertical um, width of that box is that based on observations or is that based Oh it, it just corresponds to the yeah the periods that are observable. Are observable. So this is the entire you know um, graph for the theory like whatever magnetic field strength you use and whatever periods you want to look for. Yeah, I was just wondering, because those periods are starting to get up to hundreds of years, which is com comparable to the time scale of the convection, right? So how, how, why, why sure. would you say these variations are due to a wave and a stably stratified layer as opposed to just changes in the convective dynamo? Well, we, 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 are not, we are not saying that ne they are necessarily waves, but when we look at them, I mean, especially on this kind of graphs, um, we find, especially this one, we find that there, there are structures, spatial temporal structures, that are really uh, making us think that they could be waves. But, but you're yeah, so right, I mean... The time scale that you observed, you, you showed one plot where, you, where it looked like a phase change the two. What was the time scale between those pictures? I think it might have been the previous slide. Here. This one? Yes. Yeah, that's the one. So what's the, that, that's on the order of a few years? Yeah, that's three years between here and here. And, and later we, we actually plotted the same thing in 2012 and we, in 2012 we get something that's very close to this. So it, it looks, like, I mean to the eye, it looks like a stationary wave. But, yeah, and that, you know, that time scale is a little fascinating for the, compared to the convective motion. So. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. That that's, could be a bit fast for the convective motion. Although, you know, I mean, uh, we cannot rule out you know, some, uh, some fast process. So really this graph is, um, um, was to show that uh, our options are <laughs> kind of limited, actually. There are not so many waves that are available from, for explaining this kind of uh, phenomenon. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that you don't want to get into the prediction as a universal wave, but nevertheless, can we speculate on Is there any guess in this universal Oh, uh, I won't dare to so guess. <laughs> Um, I think what we know at the most. Maybe after your retirement. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's for sure. Remember no worry about that. <laughs> Remember, we were recording this. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess the best the best observation now is this decrease in the dipole. But as you see, we are still far away from zero. And the second thing is that when you go back in time and look at archaeomagnetic data, um, the, this this happens in the past without having an inversion, a reversal after that. So there are occurrences of dipole decrease, then dipole increase. That's actually the norm. Since the Canadian Post Nobel Research Center, they have been very fast away from the most west. Yeah, so the poll, actually there are different polls. So the pole that's relevant for reversals, which uh, I think is a dipole, the, the, the geomagnetic uh, pole, the, the pole of the dipole, I mean, where the dipole intersects with your surface, this pole doesn't move very fast. It's been northward of Greenland for in a century. So the dipole is decreasing, but it's not getting, you know, uh, the, the, the inclination is, is not increasing. So the pole that's moving fast is the deep pole, 
which is the, the, the pole where the magnetic field is, magnetic field is uh, vertical. And, it, and, and we, I mean, we, we actually, I, I worked on this, uh, investigated this some time ago with some colleagues at, in Paris, and we, we found that um, this is a regional effect. I mean, this is, this is mostly due to um, um, processes happening in the core right under the pole. Well, not exactly right under it, but in the polar area. So it doesn't reflect a global process, like you know, a process that could lead to a reversal. There's no more questions. Let's thank Arnaud again. <laughs>